Thank you, and thanks, Ruta, for joining this next installment of the EPAC. Um, we've been making lots of good progress, and I know that um, we're all kind of eager to keep moving this process along so we can get closer to the end, closer to the results. But we still have a couple of um, important um, decisions to make here as a group in still in stage one here of the CGPP, where we still are um, talking about developing these sensitivities for the various scenario runs that we've already done as part of the CGPP. Um, just to give everyone kind of a overview of where we're at today, because I know it's been a little bit since we met. Um, we've we've finalized all three of the the main scenarios in the CGPP. We've presented those results um, to the EPAC. Uh, we've uh, had one meeting where we discussed the potential um, sensitivities that may be ongoing, and I think we gave an overview about how we have about ten sensitivities to play with. Two of those sensitivities are already spoken for based on the requirements of the CGPP order, where we're um, discussing kind of. Un unbottling the transmission system and um, relaxing uh, bulk transmission interfaces. So those two sensitivities are kind of spoken for, but that left us as the EPAC with um, eight sensitivities to develop as part of this process to run to kind of learn as much as we can about kind of the, the underlying development of the transmission system and generation in New York State. So we can really pr provide the best level and, and aggregate amount of detail to the commission when they're making decisions around you know what what projects and um, transmission needs there really are um, in all these scenarios at the end at the end uh, when we de deliver a final report so what we're trying to do here is kind of come to a conclusion about those remaining eight scenarios or, or sensitivities rather off those main scenarios um, we requested feedback um, from the epac members a few weeks back uh, and got uh, a bit of feedback i think we had three or four different um, entities submit feedback, which was good, and then a number of other entities kind of chime in with support uh, um, uh, for the various proposals. Um, I'll get into the specific proposals that we received in a second, because that's kind of the focus of this meeting. Um, but since then, we kind of have been clarifying with the proposers themselves about what, what was meant by some of them and what type of um, aggregations or combinations might be feasible, because we did get more proposals than spots for sensitivities. Um, so there was a bit of that, and that's one of the reasons why it's now taking until the 16th for us to really get together to kind of finalize this discussion. Um, in the background, though, just to remind folks that um, there's additional work on the CGPP ongoing. Um, stage two um, is overlapping. If you remember that timeline, stage two overlaps with this d extra development work that we're doing under stage one, where the utilities and their consultant are moving forward um, with some of the, the power flow um, development uh, for those local models that they're developing in stage two. So that work is ongoing um, as well in the background, just to let, let people know that's happening. Um, but today I wanted to switch back and just really um, walk through, you know, just off the start, walk through the proposals that were sent in and some of the high level takeaways that um, the, the state team, the CGPP team of the, the Joint Utilities and ISO we have been able to discuss and maybe come to um, some conclusions on some of the proposals uh, for you all to react to, as opposed to just having an infinite num number of uh, possibilities that we have to discuss all as a larger group. So we tried to kind of refocus that a bit so we have, all have something to react to. Um, so I, I'm going to ask for questions in a second, but that's kind of the, the focus of the meeting today is to run through the, the proposals as we received them and then to kind of present our thinking as the, the potential proposals to actually proceed with in the near term and then leave the rest of the discussion to you know your reactions to that and then additional clarifications or proposals on that um, before we get started are there any uh, questions or clarifications that anybody has at this time okay sounds good and, and i know we have some folks that probably have to drop there is um, a conference going on in Albany, the Ace New York conference, that somehow slipped through our scheduling check. Because <laughs> um, we, we actually have a number of folks participating in that, but for some reason we missed that in the, um, the scheduling, scheduling check when we were setting this up. Um, but uh, apologies to those who may have to drop. Uh, we'll try to move quickly so we can get through as much as this is possible while we still have the whole group. So without further delay, I'm going to share my screen where we have an Excel document that I put together kind of aggregating um, the results of the proposals that we received from stakeholders. 
Um, I'm going to ask maybe Jalila if if you're able to kind of track hand raising, that would be great. Um, this can be you know discussion oriented too, but we do have quite a few people on the phone right now, so um, it'd be great if folks would raise their hands to talk today because um, I and I I can't see that. So if Jalila could you manage that while I kind of talk through here? Absolutely. Thanks, Skylar. Okay. Thanks. So I tried to kind of summarize the proposals as we receive them. Um, into one document, as you can see, we have, you know, listed here a through O. Um, are the, the proposals that we receive? there's 15 of them. And as I mentioned, there are um, 8 spots left that we're trying to fill with. Um, sensitivities, we don't have to use all 8, but that's that's the amount that we have set aside. If we have time is to run 8, so we had we had more proposals than we received. You'll notice when you read through some of these things, and I did, I sent this out maybe a week or two ago for folks to review, but you'll notice when you're seeing some of these that some of them are very, very uh, similar uh, um, or very familiar. Um, so they may be able to be combined and in, into other scenarios and we'll go through, you know, some of our thinking on that here in a second. Uh, but just so that everybody, even if you didn't uh, review this beforehand, just so you all have kind of a good basis of, of understanding about what the rest of the discussion is going to be, I'm going to quickly walk through. Uh, my understanding of the proposals. Um, if the proposers want to raise their hand and add any clarifying uh, points to that, please feel free. Uh, but I'm just going to walk through uh, the 15 proposals we received really quick. Um, so the first two here are, are very similar. Um, they came from New York Best proposing to analyze two different durations of long duration storage um, to be added to the model as a candidate resource. So the model has the choice to you know, pick long duration storage as a resource in the model. Um, in a way that it doesn't currently have today. Currently, the model only has four and eight hour storage and then um, non energy limited resources as the quote unquote defer resource, um, which to the moment has only been hydrogen combustion or hydrogen fuel cells. And so, New York Best proposal to add long duration storage is, is well taken. We've talked about this a number of times on the EPAC. Um, a, a quick point on these two proposals in general. Um, the, the current modeling framework we're using in Plexos for capacity expansion and the way we're using uh, representative days that are kind of modeled in 24 hour time blocks um, is currently a limitation that's not going to allow us to fully examine the capabilities of long duration storage right now without modification. But um, the state team is, is uh, having discussions with some consultants and the NISO has, is exploring with energy exemplar um, avenues we may be able to take. Um, Probably in cycle two, <laughs> you know, we're probably not gonna be able to finish it in the next couple of weeks when, um, you know, we need to be running these sensitivities, but to more fully examine long duration storage, we hope to do it in cycle two and we're kind of starting that examination um, as we speak. But the, that does not mean these two proposals are off the table. It's just, you know, the, the full analysis of long duration storage will probably have to wait, but there may be things we can do um, that do something similar, and I'll talk about that more, um, something similar to what a long duration resource would be doing. The third proposal um, was to look at a much higher load case, you know, increasing the load in the main scenarios, for example, um, the state scenario, increasing that up to potentially the, like this load that was used in scenario three, which is maybe five gigawatts higher peak and, and um, a number of percent higher energy over the course of the year. So that was a, that was a proposal there. Um, the next scenario proposal was to do a scenario with no combustion in it. Um, we, we did one uh, in scenario three, um, but this proposal was to use fuel cells in the state scenario as opposed to hydrogen combustion. Um, and I think one of the main drivers of this proposal, after reading some of the, the feedback that was uh, provided as part of this proposal, was to really um, examine better the the added cost of building new resources in the state scenario because at the moment the the defer in the state scenario the dispatchable emission free resource is currently um, primarily retrofits of existing combustion units to then run on hydrogen um, but the downside of that is that the model does not really see a capital cost for that retrofit the the extra cost of doing that retrofit is being borne by the fuel costs over time and those variable costs over time as opposed to an instantaneous capital cost and that may be um, influencing decision making in the model so this um, this proposal not only gets rid of combustion but also kind of examines having a higher cost in the model for actually switching to a, a hydrogen resource 
Um, the next proposal was to update the model to examine more full chronology, as I mentioned, up with the long duration storage um, proposals. The model is really looking at a series of representative days and trying to solve this kind of zero carbon um, uh, net import export, you know, storage and hydrogen, all solve that whole problem for every individual day that we might experience. But what that doesn't do really is string together 8760, you know, a full year's worth of hours together to more, more optimally examine storage operation or long duration storage or, or the chronology of maybe starting a certain day with storage fully charged. And maybe the next day you start the day with no charge. The model doesn't really do that at the moment. Um, and I, that's not necessarily a, a fault of anyone or, or the model. Most capacity expansion models are not set up to do full 8760s. It's just an extremely um, computationally intensive modeling effort. And so even um, with our simplifications that we've had to make for this modeling run, it's still taking you know hours to days to get these results um, of our test runs. And so full chronology is obviously the ideal we would love to look for. And we're trying to examine ways to better um, incorporate this with the model. Uh, but this is something that we don't currently have. So this proposal is really to, you know, examine all the ways we can update this model, either this phase or next phase to get better uh, chronology. So that's that point is well taken. The next proposal was also from New York Best to examine a higher DER uh, future. Um, we, we kind of did this, you know, our, our quote unquote, you know, scenario two, which was the low transmission expected impact was a scenario where we prioritized um, you know, distributed energy resources. I think we went to a, a higher forecast for distributed PV. We also reduced the cost to do energy storage so they could do a lot more distributed storage in the model. Um, and so what we did see in there was like a much higher deployment of PV and also a higher deployment of storage, um, especially downstate, to, which is expected to reduce transmission costs. This proposal, I think, is to go even farther than that uh, because I think there's this, uh, an estimation that the the lengths we went in scenario two weren't necessarily super aggressive. They were fairly aggressive because they were kind of our high level targets for the long term solar roadmap for PV and the very aggressive storage costs. But I think there is um, some amount of thinking that things like vehicle to grid capabilities might be unlocked. There might be a lot more um, VPPs or distributed load flexibility um, that may be available to us on the distribution network. And uh, these are capabilities that aren't really modeled today. We do have some flexible load in there that represents moving when people charge, but not injecting from their vehicles, which could also be a potential use, you know, 15 years from now, for example. Um, and so there, I think there's a proposal to maybe uh, crank up those distributed resources even more to see what the kind of a more significant input from those would be. So th those first um, six proposals uh, were from New York Best. Bill, while you're here, did you want to say anything about any of them or, or add any clarifications? I'm just getting off mute, Skylar. I, you, you, gave a, you gave a really good summary. I think uh, just a, a couple clarifications. Can, can you hear me all right? I'm, I'm are we yep, at the here, conference. Yep, here, just fine. Great. Um, so, I mean, a couple, a couple of points there. Uh, the, the, the full chronology, uh, you know, we, we're not proposing that as a sensitivity, obviously, because we realize how much work it is, but we, we do think it's critically important. Um, the, and I think Skyler gave a nice job of summarizing why it's important to analyzing a long duration storage uh, and other things. It's, it's also absolutely vital for load flexibility. You know, if you, if you look at the timing of charging and the shifting of loads and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, having that uh, in the phase two of the CGPP we believe is absolutely vital, um, and uh, and so we're we're bringing that forward here to to really try to press on um, making sure that, that work is happening in parallel to the sensitivity efforts. And and I I appreciate Skyla, uh, you're you're indicating you're already working with consultants and, and talking and exploring paths in that area. So I I, 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 do, uh, I do understand you recognize the criticality of this also, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, the other the other pieces I would other comments I would make is that um, our our view on the incorporation of the uh, sixteen hour and twenty and hundred hour long durational storage as sensitivities 
uh, we were we were not picking these as two separate sensitivities, but we were thinking that uh, that that we really should be doing a, a modeling run that has a profile a portfolio of durations. Um, we recognize that that's very difficult to do with this 24 hour uh, modeling scenario that we have. And um, so, so we're proposing that um, that for any for the longer durations, that we assume that the uh, energy storage is charged going into the day, uh, which isn't a perfect scenario, but but it's better than and then trying to make the battery charge during the day for a long duration storage uh, system. Um, and you know, we I think we were viewing that uh, that could get bundled together, and I think you're you've already foreshadowed that with us uh, for for your your proposal later. Um, I am very eager to talk about your proposal later and see how we can tease out those various different uh, pieces uh, in, in that proposal later. Um, the last point I'd like to make is the higher load. Um, and the higher load um, is something that uh, is a little worrisome in the sense that we, we have a state scenario with a load projection and we've, inc we've intentionally chosen a higher load scenario also. Um, but what we aren't looking at is is a case where, you know, we're going down the state scenario, but load turns out to be higher, and that that, that is likely a risk that we really should be thinking about taking into account, and that's part of the uh, the thinking behind the higher load piece. Um, the and I, obviously we support the others also here, but I, I wanted to bring that forward. Uh, so thank you for the great summary, Scholar. Oh, thanks for those clarifications, Bill. That was really helpful. Um, the way you talk through those. So thanks for that. Um, and yes, we'll, we'll try to get through these. So we do have time to discuss the, the proposal as, uh, as well before you have to drop. So I think we, we left off down here, uh, row number nine proposal. I, I don't know why a proposal number proposal number G, <laughs> um, down here. Um, this was presented by the energy justice law and policy center. Um, this proposal was to have um, no or at the very most very low downstate defer injections. And I think the specific proposal was um, driven by kind of the, the risks of deploying high quantities of hydrogen infrastructure in the downstate area and, and potentially testing the, the an extreme limitation to that in, in potentially limiting zone J and K to having zero gigawatts of, of defer builds to see what, you know, storage and offshore wind requirements and, and potentially transmission requirements um, kind of have to step up to um, meet that need if there are no defers in downstate New York. Um, there was additional detail in that proposal um, just discussing uh, the potential availability of, of interconnections that may kind of allow for about four gigawatts of resources to be cited at existing facilities that may retrofit that would not be located in, in disadvantaged communities. So there was some, some kind of uh, wiggle room there a little bit to maybe limit um, the defer builds in zones J and K to somewhere around you know, zero to four gigawatts. Um, so I think um, there's more discussion to come on this. Just some initial gut reactions uh, to this was that you know, in, in scenario three, we ran a, a, a scenario that you know, had high load, there was no combustion resources, um, and we were not using necessarily any of the retrofits at all. So we weren't necessarily you know, kind of forcing use of existing interconnections. We were, however, you know, the model did solve, with, you know, using fuel cells with the requirement of building maybe five or 6,000 megawatts of fuel cells in and around New York City, which obviously then necessitates um, some amount of hydrogen fueling <laughs> infrastructure for those hydrogen fuel cells. So I think that was kind of the point was, you know, that entire industry and infrastructure built around that and trying to run a sensitivity without that and see what has to step up. Um, there, there was a little bit of concern from some of the CGPP team about, you know, whether this uh, sensitivity would solve given the um, headroom uh, constraints and the existing transmission constraints. Um, but after further discussion, it seems like the, it, with a little tweak to this um, sensitivity to maybe increase transmission flows um, into downstate New York to enable that flow, you know, that unbottling would probably be, be necessary to run the sensitivity. Um, so that would kind of be developing a, a separate um, scenario sensitivity kind of on its own that has increased uh, transmission flows to downstate New York to enable this kind of reduction or elimination of defers in downstate. 
So that's something we can we can discuss more later as well. Um, and then the um, the same entity uh, also requested, you know, ad additional more granular modeling of existing regional interties up to and beyond 2040. Um, I think this is a really good observation uh, that has come up, I think, in some of NISO working, NISO's working groups as well, when we're talking about our whole state decarbonizing, but we're not on an island here. You know, we have um, regional interconnections, we have regions nearby that also have clean energy targets that will also be decarbonizing. Um, and so ours, when we might have a ton of sun and might want to be uh, exporting some of that, our neighbors may also be having the exact same issue with lots of sun, lots of solar power and wanting to, to export it. So there's, you know, this proposal to kind of have a, a lot more granular look at the transmission flows, um, you know, in those later years when there may be a long, you know, a lot of decarbonization happening within and around our region um, is something um, that was proposed here that I think may be interesting to look into as well. Um, Raya or anybody else um, from EG, EJ LPC, you have anything to say about um, these two things? Any clarifications? Anything I missed? Not at this time, no. Okay, yeah, and we'll have more time to discuss these when we get to the options slide as well. Um, now we have a, a handful of proposals, and I'll try to get through them quickly because I know some folks from ACE may be going to their conference that they're currently throwing <laughs> right now. So I'd get these, through these quickly for them. Um, the, this first proposal from them in I is to relax headroom restrictions. I think one of the, the key um, issues we've run into so far is that um, in our decarbonized state, um, we have to build such a tremendous amount of renewables in all of our scenarios that um, the the assumptions that we have around headroom, like the restrictions about how much of a resource you can build in a given area before it gets very prohibitively expensive to interconnect another resource in that area, um, those end up being one of our most binding constraints um, in the model to the point where um, even relaxing some you know, bulk transmission interfaces did not look like it was going to be, um, you know, much of a, a help in our current modeling setup because the headroom restrictions were kind of determining where the resources were going to go in each case. And so this uh, proposal was to kind of relax the headroom restrictions to see, you know, in an idealized scenario with like a lot more flow within a zone itself and a lot more resource capability within a zone itself. Um, where would the, the model really choose to select all those resources? Um, the next proposal was to uh, run a sensitivity similar to the way the NISO has run on many of their um, outlook scenarios to limit the imports from HQ from Hydro-Quebec. Um, some recent data has shown those um, imports you know, may fluctuate, they might go down in certain years, or um, some folks may even expect those to go down um, in the long term, just in general. And so this proposal was to kind of examine a scenario where those three or five or 10 terawatt hours that we kind of receive as injections from HQ each year just aren't there and see what has to happen to make up for that extra energy. So that's a proposal there. The next one was to um, increase tr uh, transfer capability at the border. So basically an uh, interregional transmission proposal. Um, but there was a, an ex extra kind of caveat there um, that kind of relates to um, the import export sensitivity we discussed earlier, where you know external areas may be experiencing very similar things to what we are experiencing. So we can't just expect them to be a sink um, for our excess, you know, renewables during certain hours. So we may want to limit exports during high spillage hours, just as a kind of reference point to see, you know, if we're if we're not able to deliver across boundaries for these reasons. Um, what do we have to do internally? What's still economic? What do we really want to do um, as alternatives there? So there's that proposal. Um, this next one, I think, just um, requires a bit of a clarification that this uh, proposal was to, you know, say if if we're not already counting DERs against headroom, um, and we're just, you know, in most load forecasting, DERs are just load modifiers where they kind of adjust the load that we put into the model. And in those cases, you know, the large scale renewables are kind of just reacting to a load that is already kind of endogenous in the model, as opposed to competing with the DERs for injection, um, like headroom or, you know, peak injection times. 
Um, fortunately, you know, I went back and checked with the utilities on their headroom calculations and, and with the modeling team on how these um, resources are being modeled currently. And it looks like we are already counting DERs and like we're counting that generation from like distributed storage and distributed solar um, endogenously within the model, not necessarily as a load modifier. Um, and so that those numbers do adjust the headroom. So they are impacting the model already and we are seeing the results with them impacting that headroom. Um, so I think we're already in most of our scenarios, we are satisfying this. Um, but I actually just got a notification, someone raised their hand. Yeah, Skylar, uh, Bill Acker here, you're the best. Um, yep. I just wanted to follow up on that. That, that, that this, this is concerning, um, I, I guess, you know, it could be concerning on either, either direction, but uh, depending on how it's done, I'm, I'm wondering, are you saying that right now um, the model is subtracting out energy storage capacity from headroom for renewables? Because when we talked about it earlier, I didn't think we were doing that. I thought we were treating them somewhat differently because clearly, you know, a, a, a energy storage is not going to be outputting um, or typically not going to be outputting uh, in competition with the large scale wind uh, um, uh, in a, well, sometimes it will be, but I, it, it's clearly not as simple as just additive. And so I wanna just test to where we are there. No, you're exactly right. Thanks for keeping me very clear and honest, Bill. No, the, um, the storage does quote unquote count against the headroom, but it's only due to its injection. It's like operation at the times where the headroom would be constraining. And so it, it won't really like account for much of the headroom. Like you add the storage in and the, the model is seeing all the storage and operating all the storage, but it's, the storage is not really in most times going to be binding against many of the headroom constraints because of exactly what you said that um, hourly kind of energy operations is not really going to be competing and pulling away from the, the deliverable headroom quantity that other resources would experience. Great, that makes sense, thank you. Yep, then just, just one more thing to build on there, but with distributed PV, because that PV is, you know, if you have um, load in a zone and you add additional distributed PV that has basically the same generation profile as a larger scale PV facility in that same zone, um, that injection is going to impact um, the available load that is there to be covered by PV and will impact what the model sees in terms of the available kind of headroom available for that large scale renewables. And I think that's what this was really, this proposal was really going for was like seeing that tension, especially in like scenario two or some of those other high, high DER scenarios where distributed solar may end up kind of cannibalizing opportunity for larger scale renewable resources and to test that a little bit, um, you know, a little bit more. But I think we do, you know, in, in our different scenarios, we are kind of modeling it that way already. And so we can kind of see how the various deployments of distrib distributed PV are impacting that and kind of compare the results we already have to kind of get better information about um, kind of what the sensitivity is asking for. So I'm not sure we need to take action on this right, right away, but um, we can chat about that too if there's something additional we want to learn from that. And then the, the final one that came from, from ACE was um, looking at you know, a higher potential for renewable energy generation where we kind of remove the supply limitations and build rate limits for these large scale renewables in the model. If you recall, um, the model is kind of constrained in a number of ways, not just by, you know, the ever increasing cost of headroom, you know, to build a resource in a given uh, area where something has already been built. But we also have the supply curve model um, that was developed by the state to look at like what uh, physical constraints can we already represent how much solar and wind are available in what counties and what zones um, and what does that add up to in terms of inputs for a capacity expansion model so we have those kind of supply limits almost set as they're basically caps in the model because you can't build more you can't build a resource that isn't in that supply curve so we have kind of supply limits based on the the amount of um, solar and wind you know are the supply curve says we can probably build and we also implemented build rate limits uh, where the model is not allowed to build more than two and a half gigawatts of a given resource in the model in any given year. Uh, and so if you have a certain number of years, if you have 10 years and you're only allowed to do 2.5 gigawatts a year, you know that model basically has a cap on that resource. You can't build more than 25 gigawatts of that resource. 
Um, and so that's kind of um, something that we are running into in a couple of our um, scenarios. I think the, the NISO had presented that last time um, about how in many of, I think in all three of our base case scenarios, we're kind of hitting some of these caps, uh, certainly in certain zones, but definitely um, in that annual cap or building to that limit in a number of years. Um, and so this proposal here is to kind of remove those caps because if we're if we're hitting them, that means the model might want to go beyond them in certain years or in certain locations. And so it'd be interesting to have a more kind of idealized, um, you know, ultra copper sheet or ultra um, relaxation sensitivity here to see what the model would do without all those constraints. So those are the the five that came in from ACE. Anybody uh, from ACE want to kind of discuss those or add any clarifications or anything? Thank you, Scala Rodica here representing ACE New York. Thank you for the description. I think you captured very well what we were interested in and it's good to hear how DR are actually modeled because I thought in some initial documentation we got with key assumptions, um, DR were presented as load modifiers. So it's good to confirm that actually they are more like firm build, more like actual builds, generator builds with PV profile. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the interregional, indeed the proposal we have here under row, under K, proposal K, it's very close to H, proposal H, because at the end, the concern is that um, the way we might be modeling now is allowing to have a sink during low load hours for renewables in New York when in real in actual, you know, we may not have actual conditions, we may not have that, other because other regions have their own um high renewable penetration levels, or um because we may have storage in New York. So um the concern is that are we yeah, are we using the other regions as a big battery instead of maybe building battery in New York or um, maybe seeing more spillage, but um, that could support other generation uh, like uh, storage in particular. So that's the um, or inter like increasing transfer capability. That was the idea behind that. Yeah. Uh, okay, proposal K. Yeah, that, that's certainly interesting, and it has a lot of ramifications for the modeling. Um, if we're not able to, you know, whether whether it's like in reality we're not going to be able to, or just in this kind of test run, if if we're not allowing the model to kind of um, export a lot of our renewables during those hours when we we have lots of excess, um, that is zero carbon net exports, which in the model, you know, we've constrained it to be on an annual basis zero net imports, which means we have to be able to export as much like create as much clean energy in the state basically as we consume so that at the border imports and exports have to net basically if we have certain hours of the year or certain days where we're um, exporting a lot of that renewables and then we constrain it in this model to not allow it to do that that's actually going to also impact the importing behavior in the model and therefore potentially some of the firm needs and some of the storage needs in the model even more. So it's gonna have all those kind of layered on of effects that might be interesting to test as well. Um, the, the one thing I did see in that proposal though is like the parameters are gonna have, or they might be kind of difficult to, to develop unless we already have, like if somebody else in a different region has run something like this before and they have kind of best practices, uh, but just you know, looking at this on the face, I'm thinking, you know, how much do we increase transfer capability and then how do you identify which hours to limit um you know we have representative days we have 13 representative days they each have like you know six kind of time periods baked into them so in that way we can kind of maybe focus in on certain hours to make constraints on but we'd have to think really hard about how we actually develop the parameters to limit those exports and what hours we actually do that and by how much um, and, and I didn't even know how to start guessing that, but if, if um, this is ended up being something that we really want to pursue, that's going to be the main, I think, next step in that discussion. Yeah, and we would expect that the um, spillage could, could happen mostly during the low energy days. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think you have like four representations of below average energy days. 
Yep. Actually, as assuming a yeah high solar, high wind, um, twice will be like low load hours, where you may have too many renewables, including hydro and nuclear, and yeah, you would export those because, or otherwise, you if you cannot export them, you would have spillage, or you'll have to build battery to absorb the extra generation. Mm -hmm. And one question maybe for clarification, sorry if I, didn't, if I missed this before, on the, um, how are the other zones represented? Is it like a, like a transaction based on historical imports, exports? How do you represent the other regions? I think I might need help from the NISO folks. I, I knew this at one point at the very beginning of the process when we were talking about representing external areas, but I, I think we have basically a, a kind of each external area is represented by a single node that has its own kind of load and generation um, shape, and then we interact with them, but I, I don't know exactly how. Do we have anybody from the NISO on that might be able to answer that question, like how external areas are kind of modeled today? Yes, Skylar, this is Kevin Revis with the NISO. Um, so we have the external regions modeled to a certain level of detail. Um, so it's not just like there's a shape of um, historical flows or anything like that. So that model is actually optimizing based on the load of the external resources and also the other types of generators that are within those um, regions. So does that help answer the question? So you represent PJM with the expectation you may have for uh, renewable penetration by 2040 and after? Yes, that's right. And I, I will be honest that I am not familiar with all of those assumptions, but there is a certain, um, we do model some uh, future expectations for the external regions. So for in, in New England, I'm more familiar with New England, for example, they have um, targets that they are tr transitioning towards and we have certain model, uh, modeling for that sort of thing. Okay, so that means like all those regions are more like dynamically represented versus just one shape, as you said uh, early on, that is not being done. And maybe one, other question and can be a follow up to this call, like, how do you enforce the net zero? How, how are so I, how is yeah, this I, I can tell you what the, the constraint is, you know, we have a constraint that basically says over the course of the year, we have to, um, we can only import as much as we export. Of, of zero carbon resources, um, I, I think that is basically directly how the model sees it as well. Like it sees it as this kind of binding constraint that it has to iterate on if, it, if it's not making that decision automatically. Um, but uh, please, some from the okay. will jump in if I, if I said that wrong. So you are saying that you are enforcing this in the capacity expansion decision. If you were to relax that constraint, it will change internal dispatch with internal expansion results uh, for New York. You are not changing the other zones. You will be changing what's happening within New York. Right, so if we, if we change that import export decision logic, I think it would change a lot. Yeah, if, if we if we say, or even if we kept that logic the same, but we change this kind of spillage constraint to say in those low load hours, you can't kind of spill that. Now the model can't import as much as it would have. And so it's going to have to make different decisions in the, you know, it might change its capacity expansion decision. Yeah. Might also be interesting to see if, if you have spillage, is the model choosing something else, more storage? No, because that can be another option. If you cannot, if you don't allow to export the excess renewables, then it'll be spillage unless the model chooses battery or that's true. That's right. It might keep the same capacity expansion for renewables, but then just add more storage. That's true. We won't know it until we try it, I guess. <laughs> and I maybe the question could be like, how realistic it is, or how would you to have that net export? Because how would you enforce it? 
political like from a policy standpoint oh how do, how do we enforce that kind of yeah is that a realistic assumption import? yeah that's the question right I'm, I'm not sure we've uh exactly figured out the full regulatory framework around those <laughs> border netting um but it's the kind of the best proxy we have right now to follow the kind of the letter of the law and the CLCPA to make sure we are planning for kind of that that restriction in our own build outs. Thank you. And um, one last comment on the headroom. The other reason why we wanted uh, we would like to see a sensitivity to the local headroom numbers um, is because we were always a little concerned about the headroom not showing all uh, headroom within a zone because it is based on that headroom methodology that includes uh, substations below 230 kV. So theoretically, we would um, we would expect to see more headroom if the 230 kV injection points and 345 kV injection points were added. Uh, so the idea was to see how. Um, build out may change if you were to allow for increasing that in those headroom values. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a good point. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And Ruth, I think, has his hand up next. Thank you, Jalila. Skyla, when, when in row 14, when we say DRS generators, can you remind me if that also includes energy storage or we model them separately? Yeah, no, that's a good clarification. Um, the model actually just sees all storage as the same. The, the model doesn't represent anything like on distribution networks or anything like that. It's it's just a zonal capacity expansion model. And so in, in this model, the the kind of construction and operation of storage is just it's the same. There's only one option. There's the model doesn't choose between DER or bulk storage. It's all just one option. And then it's up to us to kind of interpret how much of that we think is going to be you know, distributed versus bulk. And so uh, the model is not really building, you know, DER storage or bulk storage It's just building, you know, energy storage. And, you know, we have to figure out where to, where to put that in general. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and I also just want to do a second is New York second row 14 recommendation, because I think when, when we actually do consider DRS generators, I think that will also allow the model to identify interregional transmission below 230 kV that wouldn't have been identified if we consider them as load modified. So I do think this is a this would be a more near term. Uh, this should be a more near term uh, option uh, if if you're uh, trying to prioritize these scenarios sensitivities. Sure. So you're saying if we if we kind of focus more on making DERs specifically a generation like candidate resource, it would it would show lower voltage interregional transmission opportunities. Is that, is that what I? What I uh, yes, because if yes, uh, you know, if we also assume there's going to be <clears throat> flexible PV, uh, flex, flexible DER, then there will be a need beyond the, those distribution sub 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 transform substations to move that power elsewhere without going to the bulk system. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. That's definitely something uh, I don't know if that um, is something we're going to be able to test in the capacity expansion sensitivity, but that's definitely something to watch as we go through stages two through four when we are citing um, quote unquote. Remember, this is little s citing and just placing these zonal resources onto a um, the kind of future theoretical um, energy system, node representation energy system. That's where we're going to see a lot of those issues. If if we have a lot of that being represented in on the distribution network, we'll hopefully be able to see, you know, what that does and what needs arise. So that's a good point. Okay, so moving on here to the last two, um, there there was kind of a an email sent from MEUA that kind of seconded the, the concept of long duration storage, but just um, in general requested additional optionality in the defer options um, to kind of put taken um, all options on the table approach, <laughs> which is something we haven't done yet. You know, each each uh, scenario we've run, we've only added one defer at a time. 
um, just to make sure we were comfortable with the decision logic of the of the model and just to see how the various resources change kind of the, the decision making in the model and, and what gaps, what quote unquote gaps they were filling. Um, this proposal was to kind of take that next step and say, you know, we've learned that if you look at the NISOs, other modeling they've done in the Outlook, they often allow their uh, capacity expansion model to choose between three, four, five different deeper options. So we should take that step and maybe add um, a different option as well. Um, we already talked about some of the limitations the model has of like perfectly optimizing what a long duration storage resource would actually be. But there are, you know, workarounds like Bill uh, just proposed about maybe you just assume a certain resource with uh, long duration storage like costs um, that starts the days fully charged and then we can figure out those charging needs, you know, it, through interpreting the results later. Um, this this uh, proposal recommended also adding nuclear as an option in addition to that long duration storage and hydrogen that we're already kind of talking about um, for the kind of high capacity factor look. Because we have not, that's one thing that has not been examined yet in the CGBP. Um, I think the, the NISO has in their outlook um, a resource called high capital cost, low operating cost resource, which can kind of serve as kind of like a nuclear-esque, you know, high capacity factor, high output resource that they run in their scenarios that um, a number of the, their scenarios built, you know, gigawatt scale quantities of that resource. Um, we have not examined any type of resource that has a high capacity factor yet as a defer, um, and so this will kind of fill fill that gap and kind of put us online with some of the other options and, and other modeling frameworks we've seen in the past. Um, and then there was one other, one final one here, um, which was a um, proposal to evaluate um, just in general imports, exports, and additional build needs, like additional capacity needs that may arise in extreme events. Um, this is actually really good, um, a really good, um, proposal here um, and observation because in in FERC 1920, for example, there's a, a requirement that all base scenarios examine an extreme weather event or examine a high impact, low probability outcome as part of the modeling, which we're not we're not really doing at the moment. We're not kind of covering that in the capacity expansion modeling here in the CGPP. Um, so that was a, a point well made um, and obviously noting that extreme events do, you know, they seem to be happening more and more with climate change. And so um, trying to test these scenarios under extreme events would be interesting. I think the the issue we run into with that type of, of modeling is um, that we're not doing hourly modeling, really. We're, we're doing kind of these representative days and those representative days are kind of structured around, you know, aggregated historical weather years. And so when you start talking about an individualized, you know, 10 or 30 hour event, um, it, it becomes very difficult for a capacity expansion model to make 20 year investment decisions based off of one hypothetical event. Um, what people usually do when they're trying to test the system under these events is to, is to kind of have a, a pre-built system that they're running in production cost modeling to see how it's dispatched and then shock the system in some way by like making, you know, what, what extreme event are we talking about? Is it like extremely cold? So you need a lot more load or a lot more heat. What happens there? And you can run the production cost model to see if you still have sufficient resources for each hour of the day. And so I think in general, just speaking for myself, I think I'm, I'm you know, supportive of finding some way um, either in the CGPP process or in a later stage or somewhere um, of evaluating extreme events, but I'm not exactly sure how this would really work um, in terms of a capacity expansion model scenario, uh, but it's still obviously very, very important. Um, Chris or any, anybody else from MUA, you want, want to step up and, and say anything else about this? Did I capture that correctly? Yeah, you, you actually did, Skylar, and I understand that this may not be near term, but kind of the, the concern that I would have would be that we are looking at 13 representative days, and at the same time, we're adding uh, a large amount of new large loads that will have a 24 seven type requirement. And then layer on top of that, that um, New York's heading to winter peaking. HQ is already winter peaking. New England will likely be winter peaking and New Brunswick. So you could have scenarios where you could have multiple days where the system is stressed 
and you need the necessary resources to cover. Okay, so that's what drove that 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 item. Um, the other thing is is going back to the uh, imports and exports um, that uh, we're we're already seeing less imports from HQ in the winter. And mm -hmm. as we go forward in New York, we're looking at a natural gas constraints. We could have wind laws. We could have solar laws that occur during the winter. And so all those have to be captured in some form. It may not, it may not be in the near term, but definitely maybe the next round or some other modeling. And then the, the other item that I would um, reinforce is I definitely agree with Bill on the 24 hour and the 100 hour storage, because I think the this the four and the eight, while it covers a basic need, it doesn't cover the the, the full long term need. Um, and then lastly, on the defers, if if you can't look at multiple defers, you at least have to prioritize the top defers to look at because I think. We're heading into a scenario where the large loads could show up sooner than the necessary generation support to support them. And so looking at the defers sooner rather than later, I think is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think there was a there was kind of a big um, kind of change in, in the thinking when these types of big loads started being forecast and coming on and that does change the calculus quite a bit. Um, so th thanks for those points. And um, before we switch to kind of, um, you know, some of the aggregations we've done, some of the, the concepts we've put together and combined here, uh, were, there, were there any other clarification questions or anything on this list? Well, in that case, I think I'll switch over to the, um, I just titled it options, <laughs> the options tab where, um, you know, based on kind of the discussion we were able to have uh, as part of the CVP team about these different proposals, we felt, you know, strongly enough about a couple of them about, you know, how it might change the stuff we've already learned, because that's what we're prioritizing here. Remember, we're, we're trying to learn more than we already know and use these eight sensitivity strategically to find, you know, new information that hasn't arisen yet in the CGBP to test kind of the boundaries of our knowledge and figure out um, what might we be missing right now and what type of information might the commission want to see in order to make educated decisions about all possible futures when we're talking about, you know, many, many, many dollars <laughs> of generation and transmission investments. Um, and so for, for this first one, um, we thought it was, uh, Kind of convenient how many proposals we got that discussed things like, you know, a, a additional defers, changing defers, um, long duration storage, removing combustion, all, all of these types of uh, resources that, uh, you know, trying to test things that are different than just allowing the model to take those basically zero cost um, hydrogen combustion retrofits. And so what we really did with this one was to take proposal. A, B, D, and N, and if you don't remember those, we'll just switch back for a second. Those are the two, you know, energy storage, um, long duration storage ones, non-combustion, you know, switching out the hydrogen combustion for fuel cells in scenario one, and then um, adding, you know, these additional D for options. Just, you know, taking that step and, and doing that in an additional scenario to where we are testing, um, a model run that has a high capacity factor resource in it um, in a way that we haven't tested so far. So this is one we we felt pretty strongly about. We we saw a lot of support for, so we already are proceeding with these ones. These are the timing that I sent. Maybe I can't remember when I sent this out, maybe a, a week or a week and a half ago. Um, the timing then was ASAP. So these are things we're already in process of now, um, was to kind of take some of those proposals and run with them. And, and so the, the discussion there internally was, you know, how do we represent all of these different options um, the way they were kind of requested? And, and so we, the, the first one was really easy where we just had to represent um, fuel cells instead of hydrogen combustion. And that was easy because we already had built a, a fuel cell candidate resource in the model for scenario three. So we just popped that into the model for the, the scenario one. 
Um, and then we did have to build, you know, a, a resource, a, a candidate resource option to represent this type of higher capacity factor resource, whether it's, you know, long duration storage that starts the day fully charged or an, a nuclear option. Um, so we did kind of a, a, an assessment of available data on the costs and, and ongoing values of those resources. Um, and we found that the, the capital cost of those two resources is very similar for long duration storage and nuclear. So what we ended up doing was just deciding to proceed with um, a single uh, candidate resource that's kind of representative of either one of these resources um, that starts at somewhere around, you know, $6,300, $6,500 per, per kilowatt in the late 2030s. Um, and we didn't allow it to be available until the late 2030s because these are resources that are still, you know, they take a long time to deploy. And in some cases, like long duration storage, they're not actually fully available at gigawatt scale today, but we do expect to need them and do expect to have them um, at least in the later part of the 2030s. And so this is a, a modeling run that we've kind of we're kicking off and we will be hopefully presenting results at future EPAC meetings and in, in the near future. And I'll, we can talk about um, next steps in like future um, meetings at, at the end here, because I do want to um, leave some time to talk about next next meetings. But this is a, a proposal here, a new sensitivity that I think we were moving with already. Go ahead, Bill. Bill, if you're talking, you, you might be on mute. Sorry, thank you. I am a mute. Thank you, Taylor. Um, still at the background noise of the conference here. Um, just, I think I understand what you're uh, proposing to do, and I think it makes sense, but I just want to make sure I understand fully. Um, so, because you were doing these 24 hour snapshots, it doesn't really matter to your model whether what the duration is, or as long as it's longer than 24 hours, and then it's going to be based on the capital costs that the model's going to select on. Is that how I should understand this? That's that's basically the concept is that, you know, we're not going to be able to re represent something that cycles over the period of two, three days, or maybe even a week or two. Um, and so it's basically, you know, starting the model is just going to see a single resource that it can just dispatch at capacity any any hour of the year. Okay, so, so, so what we're obviously missing from that would be uh, that whole conversation we were having earlier about the, uh, the spillage and the export of renewables. Um, and I, I don't, I don't see a solution, but I do want to note that, um, you know, if we're going down that path, we're, we're, we're missing, um, the ability to use longer duration storage to absorb renewables in a limited environment. And maybe we can put that back as a question to the uh, people who are a lot more knowledgeable about modeling than I am here. Um, whether there's any way to to uh, uh, to consider that into the uh, into the discussion as you're, you know, if, if the model is selecting a few gigawatts of a long duration and storage resource, is there a way to reflect that also in the charging side um, to somehow to to capture the the you know, benefits of uh, of the detailed energy? Yeah, that that's an that's an interesting thought to to maybe add, you know, and maybe an iterative layer there where you see how much the model wants and then calculate how much charging needs it would have had to to create. Um, it would have had to kind of charge with and then see where the model might be able to, you know, make some decisions around adding that. But you're right, that's something we're missing right now. Is that um, th this is probably going to look a lot more like it's going to look more like nuclear just because it's starting every day with its full capacity to, to do whatever it wants. So it's going to have a, basically a higher capacity factor than a long duration storage would able to be. Um, but also it's not going to have the charging behavior that long duration storage would have. Right, but but the other fundamental difference, at least for traditional nuclear, is this, I assume you're making this fully dispatchable. I mean, this can follow the load perfectly, right? I, I believe so. I, I don't think there's going to be any constraints on how that cycles, yeah. yeah. Good. I think I saw another hand, but I, I only see them as they flash up and then it disappears. So whoever else had their hand up can go ahead. Hey, this is Anna Summer from Energy Futures Group on behalf of WEACT. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you guys are, are talking with, um, with NISO and Energy Exemplar about um, how to address some of these uh, time representation you know, challenges and the capacity expansion stuff. And, and I totally 
you know, empathize with the difficulty yeah. <laughs> addressing those concerns in Plexus. We have those same challenges too, Skylar. Um, and um, we don't run Plexus as often as we run some other models. So I, I don't, I won't pretend that we um, have any, you know, great solutions to offer, but I, I wanted to suggest a, a couple things. Um, I mean, I've mentioned before by email my concerns about trying to model battery storage and whether you're going to get an answer that makes sense or not under these these parameters. And and uh, and I'm I'm glad that like you guys are working on and trying to to figure out how to do that too. Um, but the I guess I I still don't totally understand why production cost modeling isn't in the scope as of now. Because I, I get the the limitation around um, having representing battery storage with these twenty four hour time blocks, uh, but it almost seems like you could substitute in some of these longer duration resources and run them in a production cost run, and just see if they actually have any value and if they're actually being utilized for longer durations, for example, or being utilized at higher capacity factors. Than the four hour storage that would indicate that they do have value to the system. And then the other thing that I thought about on the capacity expansion side was that um, I wonder if you could um, fix in all of the, the non storage resources and then run the model with more relaxed time blocks, like two hours or something like that, and off, let the model choose what type of storage to add and see if that would help address the the issue with the modeling um because i just i don't i mean it's going to be hard to figure out i think what type of resource you need if you can't actually model the operational constraints or the operational characteristics of that resource mm -hmm. um, you know like you're not getting the the rte of long duration storage which is very low compared to to lithium ion storage and you're not getting the fact that Nuclear basically doesn't cycle at all. has It has like a ninety percent economic min. Um, so I just I wonder if there's other ways to kind of address that the issue around representing those longer duration resources. Mm -hmm. No, that's it's a great point, um, and it also I, I like how you brought up the production cost modeling because that is one thing that I think we could use a lot more of in the process, and that's something certainly one of my takeaways so far is is that that can really help um, with a lot of these decisions and differences we're finding. Is is there anybody from um, the JU that wants to kind of give an overview about when we may be seeing production cost model and where production cost modeling fits into the CGPP process? Because I, I do recall the the CGP process incorporating some amount of production cost modeling. I just can't remember at what at what phase whether it was supposed to be you know at the end of stage one or if it's in like stage five when we're running solution sets. Skylar, it's Liz. I I can't speak for the JU, and my memory may be a little faulty, but I think it's later. Okay. I I thought we talked about this at one point when. Um, you had to make recommendations for improvements to the process, and NISA mm -hmm. said that one of the things that they'd like to do is add in production cost modeling. So I got the sense that that could happen sooner. I just, I guess, I don't, I just don't really know what what the holdup is, or you know, what the limitation is. Yeah, this, this is Frank Walsh from uh, NISA Gargini. Um and without the order in front of me, my my strong recollection is that it happens in stage five. Right. Um, yeah. There was some specific language in the order. Um, Saying that either the New York ISO uh, or a consultant would perform that production cost modeling, um, but the, the JU has not yet uh, discussed any details on what that might look like. Um, and I think there's also the important context of, of timing. Uh, if it gets to a point where production cost modeling wouldn't fit into the the, the timelines that we've uh, that we're targeting, uh, that's another factor that would uh, I think be material to the decision of whether or not to include it. Yeah, I th yeah, I think. Um... I, I tend to agree with some of the nice takeaways, and as, as you as you mentioned, 
Um, while it's it's absolutely essential near the end to figure out how all these things operate together to make decisions on like final recommendations, it's and, you know that's where it's essential, and so that's kind of where it has fit so far. But I think that what we're realizing is in these really complex systems with all these different dynamics within days and across days, um, some production cost modeling earlier in the process to help us make some of these decisions on what flows mm -hmm. through the rest of the process might actually be really valuable yes. in future stages. Totally. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And, and I bet I bet my colleagues at the JU were kind of like, um, you know, either either you know breathing heavier or kind of shrugging a bit after we just you know requested a filing from them to condense the process. Um, but every everywhere we turn, we find new things we want to do and new things we want to spend more time on, uh, whilst while also wanting them to move even faster. So the. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The point is not lost on me, but I think these are things that are important enough in helping make, you know, potentially billion dollar decisions that we should probably um, start incorporating mm -hmm. them in the future. So thank you. Thanks for that, Anna. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and not, not to belabor the points, Scott. So th thanks for providing clarity on that. Um, not, not to belabor the point, but I, I guess if you take a step back and you think about the goal being to figure out how do you implement CGPP from a transmission standpoint, because right, that's what we're talking about here is transmission planning. It it seems like the question is really about what are the contingencies within the system under which you would need to transport lots of power, and it seems like that is going to be at those times when you don't have um, as much renewable generation within the state, and understanding like what the duration of those sorts of shortfalls is and when they happen might really inform what the what the potential. Um, fixes are for that situation. And I, th I don't think you get that through your capacity expansion modeling. I think you have to do at least production cost modeling, if not RA modeling. So mm. um, I totally agree with you about that being an important improvement here. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a really good point. Yep. Okay, thanks. I think I did see one, another hand go up. Is, is there somebody else still in the queue? Yeah, that's right. I just wanted to, so I, I get it that, you know, the state wants to model nuclear without any debate here, um, despite the environmental justice um, repercussions of it. But I guess my question is, will folks be able to see where the proposed nuclear sites are in the way this will be modeled, which is, I think, something that New Yorkers will want to know. Oh, yeah, the, the results of the capacity expansion model will be just like the, the rest of the stuff we presented so far, which is on a zonal basis. Um, it, it, we only have these kind of aggregated zones, so usually four or five counties at a time, and the, the model sees, um, you know, a price for that resource in that area. And if it's cheap enough and it, or if the uh, resource characteristics line up with what the model is looking for, it'll buy that resource in that area. So. Um, yeah. That's all. That's all we'll have. Uh, but at least tell you the region of the state. Yeah. Well, that you know, that's that's not affirmative to my question because there's only because for you know the implications of nuclear, it's not. It doesn't seem. <laughs> it doesn't. It's going to have to be built in specific places and planned for in specific places. Similar. Oh yes. To okay. The way. That, that that just reminded sorry that just reminded me of something <laughs> that I forgot to say earlier when we were talking about the setup of this model description. That's exactly right. You know, this this kind of new modeling um, candidate resource that we're trying to set up, we're trying to make it um, so that it represents either one of these types of resources based on the cost and, and that type of stuff. But we still did limit it to be only in the upstate zone. So so H through K is off limits. Um, so so it can only go in zones A through G, which is like Buffalo through Albany and then a, a bit south of Albany. Ah, I understand. And so, but still, I only mentioning this is because I, uh, I presume that there are only a handful of sites that are, you know, appropriate to to build this. Probably some of the ones that have been developed before. So it just is there a way to drill down and actually. I, identify where folks are, you know, and I'm presuming if we're modeling this, there are people who have plans to actually build it. Um, and so will we be able to see where these no, that that's right. That's a an, it's an important question, but but nothing in this process is actually proposing to cite any generation. There, there are no actual generation citing proposals here. Well, this thank is... you. I mean, I thank you. You did cut me off, but I think what I was, you know, similar to we know where existing power plants are, right? You know, we know where there's plans to repower 
exist maybe plans to repower it or retrofit it you know so in that way there is you know that's not what you said is not fully the case but my you know so and i hear where you're coming from but in this instance i would say that a nuclear power plant is even more um substantive and expensive than you know than uh, you know a, even a you know a gas cycle power plant so it you know it just that's my question. I'm not, I mean, I would, I, you know, it, it just seems that there are particular sites that, are, you know, then there's a very limited amount of sites that can be built out for that purpose. And so it seems that just for transparency, it would be helpful to know. I understand, though, Tyler, you did clarify upstate, but uh, it would be helpful to know or, you know, where where these things are going to be that or I just think that people would be interested to yeah. know. That's just my comment. To be so, honest. Yeah. There is no proposal to build a nuclear plant. We do not know where they would go. We have not identified sites for nuclear plants. You're, you're making a lot of assumptions about conclusions that you that 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 are not part of this process. They're, they're well, simply I did not, not Elizabeth. I did not make any assumption. I'm just asking that, you know, that there is, you know, that there's plans. At, you know, and there, and you're saying I'm making assumptions, but there wasn't really a debate. You know, it's been announced that you're going to model nuclear. I understand that. And so I'm just trying to get some transparency into what that looks like. Okay, well, I'm not making I'm not making assumptions about okay. any of that. But I think, you know, it's to say that it's you know a nuclear power plant is clearly you know it's not storage. It's not you know it's it can only be in certain places. And so, and you know, so that was that is you know would be my my ask because you can model it in you know. In various places, but it's only going to be able to be in certain places. So I'm not making assumptions. I'm just trying to get some clarity into what it is that you're looking to do here and how you know folks would be able to understand it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think I, yep. I think Skylar answered your question to the extent we can, uh, based on the exercise that we're doing here. Right. Right. This this modeling is only going to be able to tell us you know where in zones A A through G where might it be good to site. Uh, plants to operate like this, in, in, and in some cases, it's operating more like long duration storage. In some cases, it might operate more like nuclear. But we won't be able to even guess at more granular, kind of localized siting of that unless, like for example, this proposal gets or, or this sensitivity gets promoted um, to be a scenario that goes through the rest of the kind of like more localized assessments in the CDPP. But that's not uh, that is not decided yet. Uh, thank you for clarifying. Did somebody else have their hand raised? I, th I thought someone raised their hand yes. while I was talking. Yeah, yes, so, I, yeah. I, I, I did, Skylar Billacker, and I, I, I do apologize. I'll jump off in a moment to, go to, to start the speaking engagement at Ace in New York. Um, but but I, I wanted to follow up on that, that dialogue just now because it, it seemed like we kind of walked from the more general description of a deeper resource that could represent long duration storage or could represent nuclear or could represent something else to a discussion of putting constraints on to make it represent one of them. And I'm very concerned about that because I, 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 I would not want to have a situation where um, we are limiting um, this study to be one of those resources and thereby accidentally um, Come up with a conclusion that another resource would be inappropriate. Um, so, if we work with the constraints on to actual site for nuclear, obviously that doesn't apply to long duration storage. And and I agree with you that long duration storage, there will be a lot of it upstate, but I also believe there'll be a lot of it on Long Island, for instance. Um, so, I, I'm a little concerned about limiting it to upstate. I think you may have to do that in this case. But I would be very concerned if you were living other properties that resource. I think we have to be very clear this is not studying nuclear. It is studying a resource that could be long duration storage, could be something else. And in fact, I would even argue it's not clear because it's nuclear, you're going to study it in a property that no nuclear plant has right now, which is low to higher. Um, now, I'm not against you know, nuclear per se. I, I, I think you should look at nuclear. Um, but I think we should be very careful here and not say that we're studying nuclear uh, as, as the as the as the resource for this. It's it's a beautiful, um, and I would argue it, if you're going to call it one thing over the other, you call it one version storage. 
Um, but uh, with that said, um, the if you are going to look upstate, um, I would encourage us to be sure we're keeping a very wide net on where the siding is, because uh, as you well know, low rate storage can go with a lot of different things. So I'm going to jump in on the storage since we're going to be Yep. No, thanks. Thanks for that clarification, Bill. And you're right. You kind of recentered us a little bit <laughs> um, because, yeah, there, there is when we're trying to represent multiple things with a single uh, kind of set of assumptions, it does kind of get messy. And you're right. Um, we did probably limit it possibly more than we would have if we were only trying to represent long duration storage. Um, so that was definitely a point well taken. I, I think the limitations. One of the reasons we thought it might make sense to leave long duration out of those more con constrained long, uh, sorry, the more constrained downstate regions was because of the um, the siting and then the typical energy um, density of a lot of those resources require a lot more land and some in some cases they even require specialized land formations like um, mines or salt caverns or, or drilled holes or anything like that. And so for that type, that subset of um, long duration storage resources, we thought, you know, some amount of restrictions on siting made sense too, but obviously not for all of them. Um, there's, there's a lot of other long duration storage resources that might be able to fit in a uh, more constrained area, but we kind of uh, unfortunately had to just jam a whole bunch of um, assumptions together that we thought could kind of look at both <laughs> without making um, too, too crazy of, of, of assumptions for any one of them, but to definitely take that and maybe that's something we can look at either with another sensitivity or in future cycles to make sure we can disaggregate those and, and know what we're actually looking at. And, and that makes sense. And so to be clear, the proposal that's on the table here is to have a catch all that reflected a couple of different types of resources. It's not going to be, um, it's not going to be described as part of the next situation. That's right. Yeah, if you're still speaking, we lost you there, Bill. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I got what you're saying. You know, we're trying to represent multiple things. I, I didn't even list other things on yeah. here, like the you know linear generators and other types of um, zero emission uh, combustion resources that might operate at these kind of higher capacity factors, higher cost resources. So we're we're trying not to say like we're just studying long duration storage or we're just studying nuclear. We're trying to you know run one more uh, big sensitivity with a different type of defer. Yeah, that 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 makes sense. Um, and I, I, I support that. Obviously, there's a lot more we can do in the modeling, and, and you know, we'd like us to get to that. But I think this is a good place. To and I do have to drop off. So I'll talk about that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bill. Julie, are there, are there any more hands up? Nope, not right now. Okay, sounds good. So, so the conclusion of that is that um, with, with those kind of four uh, separate kind of proposals in there, we felt like we could hit one sensitivity that kind of checks all those uh, boxes that were proposed. Um, so that's one that we're moving forward with. Um, after additional discussion on um, the ACE New York proposals that were also seconded by a couple other folks about um, examining um, additional looks at lowering the constraints. I think I think we got five or six follow up emails from um, other EPAC members saying, oh, yeah, that would be interesting um, to, to just kind of remove those headroom constraints and um, remove the supply constraints. Um, that's another one that, you know, it was, it was supported enough and had enough of these um, proposals in one that we could get aggregate together to be basically one, you know, fully unconstrained model run where there's not limitations on all those bulk interfaces, there's not the headroom constraints, and there's not the annual build limit constraints. So the model just has access to all the resources it might want, and it can build whatever it wants, whenever it wants, um, to really kind of see that more idealized um, scenario. The one piece that we did that we're not going to be able to change, and I, I'm not even sure if this was part of the proposal, but the one, one piece we're not gonna change would be um, the supply curve. We just don't really have a replacement right now where we would just kind of completely remove the total quantity of available resources in New York State. We think that's still a really good um, assumption and basis to be making any of these decisions and removing all those other constraints. We feel like we'll probably do enough of the work. Um, so I think that that's one thing that we would probably we're going to keep in. 
um, but all the other constraints in the model would kind of be relaxed. Um, and so that's something else we're, we're moving on um, right now just to kind of get that unconstrained model run. And this will now stand kind of in this uh, sequence of sensitivities where we'll have, you know, the, the scenario one, which has all the constraints in it, um, a sensitivity one, which removes the bulk, uh, it kind of relaxes the bulk interfaces, uh, sensitivity two that relaxes the bulk interfaces and the LCRs. And then this uh, sensitivity, which will probably be, I guess, sensitivity four, which would unconstrain the headroom and the supply build out as well. So it's like we have, we're going to have a sequence of about four um, sensitivities that'll show us, you know, less and less and less constrained systems and how that changes all the renewable build outs. So that'll, that'll be interesting to compare. So those, those are two that, you know, given the, the time delay between um, our last EPAC meeting, you know, getting uh, proposals back, aggregating them, discussing them. Uh, we wanted to make sure we could, you know, start, at least have a few that we could start on now that had enough support that we had heard back from stakeholders on and, and everything. So those two are, are going to be underway. Um, and what I really wanted to focus the rest of this uh, meeting on, if people aren't too burnt out already, <laughs> um, is to focus on kind of the, the next, uh, some of these in order um, to talk through like how, how we might be able to um, kind of model some of these, you know, whether they're still of interest um, and, and, you know, how we might, and maybe even hear from the nice or JU about um, some of the constraints that we might run into if we try to model some of these. Um, but the ones that um, out of the, the list that we've discussed already, um, the ones that I think remain after, um, you know, going through the ones that we already, we either already have modeling results for, or we've already aggregated uh, back and forth. Um, these are the ones that kind of remain. And so um, what, if we just want to j dive in right here with um, this next one to discuss, um, unfortunately, I think Bill just dropped, but I think we can still have a, a good discussion about um, what it might look like to take the state scenario or scenario two and go even further with DERs. Um, I think in our, our maximum case so far, uh, scenario two pushes solar, not, not actually um, necessarily even beyond forecast, but it pushes it to the limit of um, the solar roadmap forecast. Um, so there's potentially room for growth there in the distributed PV forecast. Um, and then it, we also don't do anything right now around uh, vehicle to grid assumptions. And so that would be something we would have to discuss and kind of build out um, assumptions for how that, you know, that resource might operate and what quantity, what maximum quantity we might want to do. But does anybody have any thoughts about, um, you know, maybe a, a super high DER scenario and, and whether that's, you know, of interest and in, um, what the values are there? Well, maybe to get more, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, maybe just one comment from, uh, given that we have a, a scenario two with more DER, uh, I, I think it's worth considering the merit of, of this sensitivity. Yeah. I yeah, think yeah. the merit. Yep. Yeah, this is this would you know maybe add another ten or fifteen percent uh, distributed PV to the model, which obviously will probably cannibalize some of that um, larger scale PV, depending on on the kind of the locations where that that is cited. Um, vehicle to grid, you know, that's something that that would have to be discussed about how how that injection actually works, how to spread that across the state, and you know whether there's a difference in the availability of that resource from winter to summer. Um, I think these are all certainly um, uh, assumptions we can make, and they're 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 doable to to make those assumptions. It's just they will be kind of heavily constrained. Um, we'll have to do a lot of uh, thinking there. Uh, any thoughts on um, how you know vehicle to grid might uh, want to be operated? You know, should we just have some proportion of EVs be capable of this in the model and then calculate kind of that that capacity and let it be kind of a two or three hour resource um, in the model. Uh, 
a very quiet group. Yeah, well, the, the person who proposed this um, had the drop, and he's currently speaking about this on a panel <laughs> uh, at the East Conference. At the East New York Conference. Yeah, like oh, Grid of the Future type stuff. <laughs> Talking about grid of the future, V to G, VPPs, all that good stuff. So um, he definitely, Bill would be the person to help uh, kind of scope this more. So I'm thinking um, if folks on this call end up having more thoughts about this, um, please email me in the next two or three days uh, about, you know, your thoughts about, you know, can we, can we go how much farther beyond the 20 or 22,000 megawatts of distributed PV by 2040? How much farther beyond that do you think we can go? Um, how much V to G, where should it go? What are the operational constraints? So I'll send an email out of this meeting kind of clarifying that, but you know, this is probably one that we'll just um, discuss more offline. Skylar, this is Anna Summer. Again, this is not really answering your question, but um, I guess when I think about DERs being incorporated into this kind of analysis, uh, I feel like the question is not, how much rooftop solar are you going to add, but what kind of load flexibility would you need? And it feels like the answer to that question depends a lot on um, when it is that you need to shift the load. And I would guess that that would align with the times in which you're otherwise having to curtail renewable generation. And so I wonder if there's a way to kind of pull that out of the model first, and then you can answer the question about whether more DERs would would help with that. And again, it, it might need, it might be that you really need to do that with the production cost run. But um, it, it just it, it feels to me I I would go to load flexibility before I go to rooftop solar, even though I know that's kind of how the the more DER scenario was structured. Or that's largely what it was structured. Yeah. On. yeah, I think I think for the scenario too, we went with the kind of flexibility assumptions that allowed both. EV kind of a certain amount of EVs to manage their charge and put yeah. layered in a little bit of additional load flexibility. Um, yeah, yeah. So going yeah. bigger on that might be you. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm thinking about all the measures that I'm guessing are not in there, like hot water heating or auto DR or um, you know thermostats in the winter time, um, maybe even the summer, depending on kind of what your the generation mix looks like in the later years, um, like that sort of thing that would be hard to capture with the existing assumptions. Yeah, no, that's true. We'd have to have kind of that profile of uh, resource added in there or just kind of augment the kind of shape, the flexibility shape we already have and allow that to be, you know, a higher amount of, of megawatts available to be shifted. Mm -hmm. So we, we can definitely think about that. Um, because that that probably will be the biggest thing, the biggest value. Because you don't have to like V to G. If you use it, you then have to recharge it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's still like a battery. Whereas that kind of load mm -hmm. flexibility kind of is a almost a zero loss battery yep. <laughs> in many instances. It might have more value. Which, like I agree yep. with that. Yep. Were there any hands? I thought I saw a hand raise. Sorry, I had a. Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. I the in addition to Anna's comments, the other, um, the other comments I had was whether this is more appropriate for like a distributed, um, distributed, um, system sensitivity, versus this uh, more like local bulk transmission planning. Uh, but leaving it at this comment, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be interesting to hear from GUs as well, like how I understand this is like something maybe longer term, but how uh, just seems like something that can be thought of, but maybe on the distribution side first versus this yeah. level of planning. Yeah, that, that is a really good point. We do, you know, with a zonal capacity expansion model, <laughs> it's it's hard to say what, you know, a, a bi-directional charger at a, you know, parking garage or at a home is really doing to the electricity system. 
we're really just seeing those very high level bulk impacts of you know additional storage injection at peak and, and what the value is there. We're not really seeing the full kind of system impacts all the way down from the distribution network. So I definitely agree. We learned we would learn a lot more if this was kind of optimizing on a distribution network scale first and then kind of plugging those types of learnings in. Um, I don't think we're gonna have time to do any of that. <laughs> so we're gonna have to live with, you know, if we, if we wanna test something like this, we are probably gonna have to live with just kind of a higher level representation of these types of DERs impact on the transmission system. Um, so we'll, we'll try to keep try to keep scoping this in the next couple of days and see if it's something that folks still think is gonna be valuable even with the, the kind of limitations that we're up against. Chris, did you raise your hand? Chris, if you're if you're talking that you might be on mute. But I saw a oh, okay. yes. um, I had a similar thought in that I it, it may be more distribution related and maybe part of that other proceeding. And then the only other comment I had for you to think about would be kind of the layering of this. When would you expect it? And and like what would be the the total quantity at some type of build out over time? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the the way we could scope this is kind of say maybe we have, you know, 10% or 15% more distributed solar sprinkled across the state. So like two or 3,000 additional megawatts of, of distributed PV like that, um, which would basically be representing, you know, additional rooftop or value DER solar. Um, but would really show up in the model is just kind of another baked in solar load profile in that area. Um, for V to G, we would probably say something like maybe there's, you know, 200 or 500 megawatts of EVs at any given time are capable of injecting power and basically put that into a model, into the model as a kind of a fixed resource. The model won't have to buy it in terms of a capital cost. It will just have an extra, you know, two, three, 500 megawatts of basically storage that it would use. But now that I just said that out loud and just talked through it, it, that probably wouldn't show us much. It would probably just remove 500 megawatts of storage from the model and use this instead. <laughs> it might not actually you know, cause the type of you know, massive difference like, like we're expecting, but um, it would at least provide that at like a different potential areas or different cost. Right, and then, and then two other things would be, you might have a seasonal difference that occurs and there could be kind of a uh, an exhaustion factor where if you call it too often do you start to lose a percentage of the customer so they're similar to like what you see on scr if you call them at a high frequency so that would yes. just, just be a couple of other thoughts yep that's that's something we we learned recently looking at some results from california and texas i think the the industry folks the vpp industry folks call it like persistence um you know how many days in a row can you can you call this before it starts kind of degrading and, and you have what kind of less and less participation because if we are asking individuals to do things with their cars or aggregations of individuals using an app from their home charging station or something you know that's not necessarily something where everyone's going to be exactly in the same area parked at the exact same charger every every day at that exact time. So that's a, a great point. And um, we'd have to think about that and see if that's also something we might be able to incorporate into the modeling. But um, once again, that's definitely something that's probably better captured on a more granular model and tough in a representative day situation. <laughs> but but we can certainly think about it and at least at the very least discuss it while we're doing the modeling. Okay. Well, apparently all I had to do was say we weren't going to talk about it anymore, and then we get all these great conversations out of it. Um, so here to this next one, um, switching to, I think it was it was going to be building on um, scenario three, where there's no combustion in the state, and we have this um, a load shape that is more representative of a no combustion future. Um, so the load is a, the electric load is a little bit higher across the state. Um, I think this proposal is building on that to say, you know, 
trying to also remove that um, additional uh, significant hydrogen infrastructure that may be required to kind of sufficiently feed those five to 6,000 megawatts of fuel cells um, and kind of cons constraining the model to, to use less DFERS, less of those hydrogen um, DFERS in downstate New York. Um, is there a strong opinion, and maybe this is uh, for you to start, Raya, is, is there a strong feeling of whether you'd want to start at the the lower number first, the zero, let's just like cut, cut it out completely to kind of bound the analysis? Or if, if you want to start with the four uh, gigawatts that was in the proposal? Hi, Skylar. Thanks for asking for a clarification. I don't believe we'd want to go to four, but it's challenging. I know we can only have one rep on the call and it's challenging for me to respond in, you know, to this particular question in real time. Um, is this something that I can uh, get back to you on? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was just, you know, trying to kind of narrow down the proposal I, a bit to see if we wanted to completely eliminate the option of DFERS in say zone J and K, or if there was some, some amount of flexibility um, to keep some in there. No, I understand this is I'm thinking of what does it mean to pick a number between zero and four. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, which which number to pick? Exactly. <laughs> but I, I do I do understand the clarification. Yeah. Question. Yep. So any any other thoughts on kind of this kind of uh, more constrained version of scenario three? Folks? Hi, this is Julia Castagrande. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Oh, great. I just switched to my phone, so I wasn't sure if this was going to work. Um, hi, this is Julia from the city of New York. I think this is interesting and I wonder, I know Skylar, we had a separate conversation a while back about not having beefers in disadvantaged communities. Um, and I know like maybe that was going to be a challenge because of um, networks and such, but um, considering like the majority of um, the state system is created our new city and downstate. I wonder if this can kind of be a proxy for that um, and what you, what you think about that. Yeah, I, th I think that based on, you know, the, the conversations we've had um, here based on, you know, localized investment decisions, that's really something we have like no information on in um, stage one. You know, we're talking about county level, usually four or five counties at a time are aggregated into this model. And then as we move through the, the modeling, we have to choose kind of individual electrical um, system components that uh, are having these renewable resources and other resources interconnected to. So even, even in that stage, we don't necessarily know where the, where the asset itself is, is located. We might know where its electrons get injected, but we don't know like the physical site. So that's definitely, I think you, we're completely accurate in your, you know, your representation of what we, we talked about previously. You know, it's just really hard um, through this type of planning process to say, you know, physical geographic locations of the of the projects that are generating the energy. We can tell by by the time we hit stage three, we can tell with very with a high accuracy what substations are receiving all that power, but we still won't know, you know, the specific zip codes where the power is coming from. We we will know the zone though. Um, and so on a zonal basis, um, it's really hard to tell in the capacity expansion model whether you're going to be picking things that may end up in disadvantaged communities. But I think you're exactly right. The one way to guarantee it is to not let it build it at all. <laughs> you know, like if you don't if you don't allow any DFERS to be built in the model in those areas, like in the zones J or K, the model doesn't, you know, there, there's no guesswork in future stages or, or wondering whether, you know, the injections in a certain area might be coming from a disadvantaged community. So that would eliminate that guesswork and kind of provide a, a bounding assessment of, you know, literally zero um, in, in, of that type of hydrogen or other deeper infrastructure in, in disadvantaged communities. Um, did you have any follow-ups on that? Because I was just gonna make one more point about that too. Uh, no, that that makes sense. So that's interesting, and of course, there are disadvantaged communities outside of Zone J and K. But I think like it could be just of note that there are more. So um, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, and and in such a constrained constrained area, having you know all those um, in, individual 
areas in such a small physical location, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to avoid those physical footprints also, as opposed to upstate where you might have, you know, a similar number of, of zip codes um, that are that are labeled as disadvantaged communities, but you might have more physical space with which to cite resources and avoid those once you get to those kind of actual real world citing decisions in in future years. Um, the the one caveat I was going to put out um, on this though is you know just thinking forward um, for what this might mean. You know we already we ran this scenario without this constraint, and it built. Um, 5,000 megawatts or so, maybe even a little bit more, of fuel cells in downstate and 16,000 megawatts of batteries downstate. And so if we're talking about removing the, the fuel cells, that, that five plus gigawatts of kind of firm, quote unquote firm, in the kind of modeling sense, firm resources need to be replaced by something. And so that's going to have to be replaced, you know, in, in our currently modeling construct with um, offshore wind four or eight hour storage. Um, and once we get to this state when that where we are in like 2040, we're already really far down the um, ELCC, which is that capacity value that really the value of electrical injections from those resources. We're already really far down the value curve for storage and offshore wind. And so adding more of those, it means we're going to need more units of those per unit of fuel cells that are replacing. So we might end up needing maybe 1.2, 1.3, or even more megawatts of storage per megawatt of fuel cell we replace. So we're still building something. You know, we might not be building things that rely on a hydrogen infrastructure, but we are building things that rely on, um, say, lithium ion batteries, the interconnection, um, interconnecting poles and wires and offshore wind substations in those same physical areas. Um, so just wanting to make sure that that's the important distinction. You know, it's it's really mostly about trying to, you know, test the scenario with no hydrogen infrastructure at all in disadvantaged communities. Um, and that it's okay that we're, we're probably focusing more offshore wind, um, electrical components and batteries in, in and around those areas. Just want to clarify that that's still good. Maybe, Skylar, one clarification question. Uh, so are you saying that this approach of adding generation, it's already decided? Um, there is also the note on freeing up transmission, because I think at the end is uh, the outcome will be based on the assumptions you allow to change. So are you saying that you'll change trans uh, transmission um capacity zone to zone will be increased or are you saying that the generation the, uh, the transmission capacity is fixed and you're kind of like the model will choose offshore and storage which is kind of like what you expect the model to yeah choose. no that, that's a really good point thanks for clarifying no i think um based on some back of the envelope calculations about the capacity value and how to replace the the firm defer builds from scenario three i'm not sure that the model would solve if we just didn't allow any defers in downstate at all. Um, and so I think we'd probably have to run the scenario assuming either a partial or complete um, relaxation of the upstate downstate transmission flows um, to kind of allow kind of sharing of the um, capacity requirements for downstate. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a question of, uh, like you were asking zero or four gigawatts, you, it's probably like a combination of how much transmission you think can be, yeah. can happen feasible versus the generation, or you may have a mix of the two, both happening, some different and some transmission. Yeah, I, I think, I think that's a good, good observation. And to a certain extent, we're almost. Uh, presuming the answer if we're if we're relaxing the transmission before running it, but I, I think if, if we're trying to see what it takes to um, guarantee no, um, you know, defer build out in zones J and K, I think we were we were concerned about 
using the model setup time and the model runtime for a, a sensitivity that might not actually solve. And uh, so I think we were we were considering, you know, what to what level might we want to relax the transmission system first to make sure we at least get a, a solution and then, you know, kind of make conclusions from there. But happy to take feedback on that too, if if you know anybody feels strongly of one way or the other there. Skyler is Keith from the Nine Seven. Hi Keith. Clarify, clarify one one point on the idea for the sensitivity and what I've been hearing. Uh, certainly, I, I was following along, and, and I, I think with certainly none of this opining on what the model could do is, you know, it's helpful to try to think about it. But it's we need to be open to be surprised what the model tells us, and understand what the model tells us with the, the constraints that we provide it. I was pretty well following along with the you know you were kind of talking about the fuel cell assumption from um, scenario three and how much uh, battery storage was built in New York City. Um, so if you were to replace the D for fuel cell and not allow it to be built in J, uh, more batteries would need to be built. I, I, I tend to agree that that's a, a likely result that we may see out of the model here. Um, I would be surprised at this point if we observed limitations due to the transmission. I do believe uh, Kevin Ravis can, from the NICER can speak up here if I'm way off base. But I believe most of the battery builds in New York City are primarily being driven to help satisfy uh, LCR requirements. And after all that's achieved, it's being built because we've ran out of resources in other zones. Uh, so it can only build batteries and it can only build uh, offshore wind. There's there's no more EPB you build, can build. You've built that. Uh, you've reached that two and a half gigawatt per year constraint. There's uh, land-based wind has been maxed out, so there's really nothing more to give. So again, I, I don't want to think it's it's transmission; it's those other things uh, that that come into this. I got anything wrong, Kevin? Please correct me. Thanks. Okay, so that's some helpful feedback. Can I um, just kind of ex expand the discussion a little bit then? Um, so if we take scenario three and just like you said, you know. Um, if we maintain the transmission network as it is, we we currently had 16,000 megawatts of batteries in zone J. We have, I think, 11 or 12 gigawatts of offshore wind, maybe a little bit more, um, and then five or six gigawatts of fuel cells. Um, if we remove, you know, based on what we know about the ELCC curves for wind and storage, if we remove those five or six gigawatts of fuel cells and told the model it still had to solve and, and resolve those, you know, the local capacity requirements and hit this, the kind of, uh, you know, reliability targets, what, what's kind of your gut about what would happen? Do you think the model would still be able to solve with the amount of transmission in that scenario, um, given the, the low capacity value of storage and offshore wind at that time? Um, or do you think the transmission would eventually be binding? I think it would still solve. I mean, it's tough to say whether or not it would be binding because it's going to be building those resources most likely directly in zone J. It's not going to try to move it from upstate to, to downstate. Yeah, I guess the the main the main constraint might be like the availability of additional offshore wind and storage um, in the model there. Right. So I guess the question would be more like that once you've maxed out, and I forget how close we were to the build limitation for offshore wind in scenario three. Um, but once you reach that, how much more batteries can you build? There was no build limitation there, so whatever whatever the remaining gap is, uh, I'm going way out on the limb here, of course. Uh, the model, once it's left with just batteries, I guess we just have to build batteries uh, until you yep. finally reached a transmission limitation and it would say um, that the solution wasn't achievable. But I got the feeling is that we're not going to see that here. Okay. Well, in that case, we, we may be able to just kind of um, Throw, throw the back of the napkins, throw those away and, and kind of start with the initial model setup and just, you know, see what we can learn from that initial setup then. Great. 
Okay, so we, we can also, Raya, if, you, if you're interested, we can also just have some more discussion offline. And if you want to follow up with anybody else, uh, we can also discuss this later in the week. Thank you so much. Yep. So moving on, I know we only have 10 minutes left, but um, there's one more um, of the you know, stakeholder proposals that's left. I, I think we'll need some more time maybe to discuss these extra, you know, ones that were just thrown on here by myself and others, the CVP team, just as potential um, other discussions of interest, but to kind of round out the stakeholder proposal discussion, um, this is the the kind of combination of um, the ACE New York and EJLPC uh, proposal about taking a, a more detailed look about um, interregional flows and finding a way to craft a scenario that kind of um, maybe further constrains um, our exports during certain times. Um, so that's that's something that you know I think I heard. Uh, Pretty good response to, um, but interested if other folks have feedback on that. Hey, Skyler, it's Mike Spector from Grid United. Hi. Um, I'm happy to see this one come back up on the list. This is one that. I brought up, I think, 11 months ago when we did our initial scenario theme proposals. And the two items here that is difficult to, to define this or model this, I think, has been one of the pushbacks on this. And also that this wouldn't be 100% clean from other regions. I think, with, you know, Vermont, Connecticut, other. ISO New England states having clean energy targets that I would question that as one of the items that would push back on this. And obviously we have Champlain Hudson, which is an interregional flow of 100% clean energy. So I guess the question I have is how is how how can we model this if it is difficult to model it and uh come up with some solutions because that's been one of the things that I've, I've, I've heard about this, that it's difficult to model and I'm not exactly sure why. Yeah, yeah, I think it's mostly comes down to the current representation of those um, external regions in the capacity expansion model. Um, ICE in New England is basically a dot. <laughs> it's like a single point um, that has kind of a, a generation mix that changes over time and kind of a load that it's hitting um, in each uh, time period of the model. And the time periods are, are representative days. So we have certain 24 hour periods that are broken up into four hour blocks. And so th the issue that we run into is, um, you know, if we're trying to limit exports during certain times, how do, you, how do you build that constraint in the model? Do you say like, if solar or wind injections increase beyond this point, then we we shut it down or we have to it's going to be spillage unless you build something else um at, at what point like how do you build constraints into that interregional kind of flow um and so i think one of the things that was suggested earlier in the call was to maybe look at the representative days that we already have for, from the from the first scenario um and kind of look at those and try to see when those um, exporting hours might be happening. And if it's during those times where, you know, the Northeast might have really high wind and really high solar at the same time, um, there's a chance that New England might be having the same thing. And so maybe we put some limitation, like 10 or 15, 20% um, reduction in export capability over that line during that hour, because everybody else is gonna be trying to flow power over that line as well. Um, but th those, you know, the difficulty here is that you have to prescribe everything. There's, there's not necessarily an easy knob you can just turn to, you know, open up flows, but, but reduce them during certain time periods or certain types of um, time periods, like when you have high renewables. Um, but that's, we, we still think, we agree though, you know, this is something that has come up a number of times. And so now that we have the sensitivity to be able to kind of maybe work through some of those modeling difficulties, we might be able to discuss that and come out with something. Thanks for the explanation, Scholar. What about the other way around where you could actually import 
clean power from other regions, uh, Hydro-Quebec, I assume New England. Is that also in this proposal? Oh, I don't know. Um, there was a discussion about potentially increasing the overall ability to flow power, um, but really keep, I think both of the proposers who were kind of interested in this the most were really talking more about um, the the interregional flows being more of a, a constraint than an opportunity at the moment. So I think that we are kind of framing this more as a constraining scenario than a opportunity to kind of increase total clean energy imports, for example. Yeah, I mean, that's why if you take a look at Chippy and its effect on, you know, some of the NISO presentations I've seen lately that if Chippy doesn't, you know, it has a drastic effect um, on some of the you know outcomes in 2032 and so forth. So, and some deficits would be caused down the line. So, are there opportunities for similar projects interregionally? And uh, I think that's something that would be great for EPAC to look into also. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Any, any other thoughts on this? Just to say it would be, it would indeed be good to have these conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <can> figure it out. <laughs> yeah, if there's, if there were, I mean, I think um, it might be tough to find another chippy, you know, <laughs> it's going to be, I mean, um, trying to find Areas that are like external but close enough that might be able to inject, you know, significant quantities of fairly stable or reliable power. I mean, that would be of of tremendous value to anybody. Um, you know, obviously happy to hear any more um, ideas around that. Um, but I think that that'd be t something tough to model because we'd be kind of once again, it's just be a um, highly prescriptive guesswork about like where might the next type of chippy come from and what does it look like? Not not put it off the table, but just <laughs> I think it's something that we've I think talked about less so far. Thanks, Skylar. Okay, well. At least we did uh, technically touch on all the stakeholder <laughs> proposals and the descriptions. Um, as I said before, these the first two are are going to be in process. We'll come back to a future EPAC meeting um, with those, and then we'll continue the discussion of the other three via email over the rest of the week. Um, I did want to um, throw out there that we are expecting results from all of these to be able to be ready publicly. Um, to, to present to the EPAC uh, in the near future. So we hope to schedule another EPAC for two weeks from now to share a bunch of those results, uh, followed by potentially another EPAC in short order after that, either the following week or, or a week after that. So um, a couple EPACs coming up soon, and you'll be receiving an email from me describing all of this and requesting any additional feedback um, in the next day or two. But thank you, everybody, for your your participation today. I think we made a lot of great progress. And as always, feel free to reach out um, uh, any anytime with additional feedback. And we'll we'll talk again very soon. Thanks. Bye.